Yes, hello folks, welcome to the weekly Manchester United podcast. Everyone else is always Phil Brad, joining with me, regular co-host, the accident, James Rhodes. Lots to talk about today, of course. We um, talk about the draw at the weekend against Bournemouth. Um, so much, of course, has happened since then. We're talking about Eric Ten Hag, Anthony, Garnacho, liking tweets, um, John Murdoch, of course, out of the football club now, which was predicted. Um, some of the other things that's going on and... Um, the condition and state of Manchester United, and it seems like every week we're debating the future of Eric Ten Hag. Um, and um, we'll obviously talk a little bit about that and what is going on with that. Uh, first of all, mate, how was your weekend? Did you have a good weekend? Yeah, yeah, pretty good. It was a uh, decent overall, good weather here. Did some coaching on my son's team, and I can definitely say that the five-year-olds are probably better behaved than uh, than what we saw out of United over the weekend. You have a, so, you have a couple of holding midfielders in there, man? <laughs> you know, I, this actually been my main strategy is to is to take a kid and specialize them to be one of those holding midfielders because uh, I got tired of watching games and not seeing well, I'll hurry up I'll do it we, myself. <laughs> we'll need him in about 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, anyway, um, last course we'll talk about Bournemouth game, which um, – has very similar traits to what we've been watching all season. Sure. Um, you know, the first half, James was unforgivable. Mm. And I'll be honest, mate, I'm sitting watching United so many times this season, shaking my head in complete disbelief at the goals they concede. And um, I'm going to say some things in support of Ten Hag and some things that are critical of Ten Hag. Um, one of the things that I can't understand about the Bournemouth game, and we've seen this so many times this season, where United have approached the game knowing that a win would benefit them so much. Um, I mean, I look at the Copenhagen game at home, a game they had to win, and they came out and played like it was a pre-season friendly. No intensity, no desire, no no nothing. I look at the Brantford away game. You've just beaten Liverpool 4-3, international break. Here's an opportunity for you to show that you're going to build on this, that this has been inspirational, that I, and there was no intent to win the game. Uh, yesterday, um, or the, or the game of the weekend, um, they would have known before they went into that game that Spurs lost. Great opportunity to put yourself back in the running. And that first half was an indictment on Ten Hag, those players, the club. And um, and it feels like United are still at that stage where there's, I think any of us will help this summer, but all the problems that have gone before the put United in this position are still so present at the club. And oh, the stuff that I'm hearing from people, you know, from players' representatives and stuff is just... It's so destroying it. Yeah, it is. It, it's frustrating. And, and you know, it, I don't think, you know, every single week when leading up to a game, I kind of wake up that day and think, and I allow myself to get a little bit of hope. Like, you know, something's going to be a little different <laughs> you know, today. You know what I mean? Like, I was going to watch an edit, but I don't know why. I know. I, like, I, leading up to it, I don't think anything's going to change. And then that day, you know, that indomitable spirit of optimism peaks up a little bit. And within 20 minutes, it's mm. absolutely mm -hmm. battered and bruised yep, back down. Exactly you know? And you think, all right, nothing's going to change. And then we'll sit here and say, look, nothing's going to change between now and the end of the season. And it's not. Nothing's going to change. We play Coventry. You know, we have a few easy, easy games coming up. No such thing, man. That could easily be one. It still isn't going to change anything if they win those three games or not. It doesn't really make a difference. Um, but, yeah, the, it, it is this issue. Look, I mean – where it comes from, and 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 like you over the weekend, I don't know what it is, but this last weekend it felt a bit like the dam burst to some degree, in terms of things kind of coming out um, via so many different channels, sources, things like that. Um, that I was kind of shocked because it's been a little bit quiet in in some respects, and and it really just was like a flood of things that occurred and. You know, everything that's been happening for years and years, the lack of leadership at the club, the lack of direction, the lack of control, the lack of so much uh, that sets apart clubs that 
are successful and just in general groups, you know, organizations, whatever you'd call it, that are successful from what United have been doing um, always shows up. And I think a little bit what's going on right now is once you're not really playing for something, which mm -hmm. they're not playing for anything, boredom is, and I say boredom because it is almost boredom, but uh, boredom or waiting is a, is a really dangerous position to be in for people uh, because they stir up trouble and problems start to arise when people get bored, when people have nothing to do, when people feel unmotivated, when they don't feel like there's something that they're really striving for when the season feels like it's over. And this happens to everybody. If you ever, you know, you're sitting around, you know, with kids, they sit around when they have nothing to do. That's when they get into trouble, when they've got nothing they're trying to accomplish, nothing to go for. And it, and it's the same with this team at this point in time. And, and I think that it's, you know, it's, it's really uh, making for a little bit of an ugly situation that that's forming. And obviously we're so close to the end of the season. So that's kind of to be expected. But it's 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 just a mess. I, I you know the the tactical issues, the things like that on the pitch, the why the performance was bad, the individual things. It's it's the same thing we've been talking about at week in and week out for months now. So there's not much really to uh, there's nothing new to say about any of that, is there? It's it's the same as ever. Look, there's something inherent in all human beings. If to get someone off a couch to do something. The first thing you have to do is instill belief in that person that what you're asking them to do, they can do, whether that's an individual goal or collective. And once a human being doesn't believe that they can't do what they're asking them to do, they'll drop their levels 5%, 10%. That's all it takes at this level to see exactly what you're seeing at United right now. <clears throat> because when you want to accomplish goals, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to do things you don't want to do, right? You have to make sacrifices that are uncomfortable. You have to come out of your comfort zone. You have to live a certain way. You have to sleep a certain way. You have to eat yep. a certain way. You have to remain focused in a certain way. You can't get distracted by stupid stuff. You have to have <clears throat> collective buy-in towards a goal that these players believe they, that is obtainable. So they'll make those sacrifices if they believe there's a dividend at the end of it. But if they don't, they won't. And this has happened so many times where you cannot get alignment in United towards collective goal because they lose the belief that it's obtainable. Once they lose belief in the person that's leading them, that their methods will get them there, you have a serious, serious problem. Now, we can say this shouldn't happen, right? Players, human beings shouldn't do this. They should remain 100% professional, but, but human beings are human beings, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's how it is. This is where I think the losing the dressing room part comes in, is that what you really do is you lose belief in players that you can deliver on the goals and get them to a certain place, right? I mean, the, the, to to be successful, James, consistently, you you have to almost live like a monk. Most human beings don't want to do that. That's very difficult to do. And if they don't believe that there's any reason or benefit to do that, they won't. And so this is where you can see the intensity with which you need to play with, that they're not going out thinking this is a must-win game. And they have major problems all over the pitch. I mean, there's been some really good tactical breakdowns. Danny Hagenbotham done it on the way United are lined up. But I've told you before, you know, I've had conversations with people about how United were lined up and have had this very similar um, response where professional footballers see things in a way you and I don't. Yeah, yeah. And they see a lot of flaws in how Ten Hag is set up. Um, but, you know, there's certain clicks in United's dressing room that are troublesome. And the Casemiro, Varane, Ronaldo, Garnacho click. Right? So Ronaldo's already gone. High probability that Varane and Casemiro are heading out the door with him. Um, you see the situation that's going on with Garnacho where he's liking these, stu these stupid tweets from, um, well, we'll get into that later, from Mark Goldbridge. Uh, I'm not going to blame Mark Goldbridge for Garnacho liking those tweets. That's Andrew Garnacho's fault. He shouldn't have done it. Uh, and this is one of the problems with social media. Um, 
but that would be worrisome for me if I was United because you can only imagine the conversations that are going on with Garnacho, right? From people that he still really looks up to, like Cristiano Ronaldo. How does Eric Ten Hag retain support of people like that whenever it's highly probable that Varane, Casemiro, the legs will be gone at the end of the season? Casemiro's playing like a player that knows he's gone at the end of the season. Yeah, for sure. I, I agree. And, and it, you know, it's, it, you can see it. Uh, Casemiro, I mean, there's a clip. It's probably happened ten, five times a game. You can see it yesterday. Uh, Rashford loses the ball high. There's a, it, it kind of made its way around and chases it back to defend it. Casemiro dives in and absolutely out of nowhere to make a slide that had no chance of winning the ball. And he doesn't have to run then. And you can see it every time he has to. We kind of will just dive in and, and watch it go. And, you know, people's attitudes are reflected in the way that they conduct themselves when they're playing and when they're doing things. You can kind mm -hmm. of see their intentions. And when you see somebody not doing that, their job, essentially, to get back to do these things, um, there's an intention behind that to, to not work, to not uh, put it in and, and, you know, I, to some degree, I can't blame him. Uh, you know, once again, this is to, uh, to a large degree why you don't sign players like Ronaldo, Veron, and Casemiro when you're in the situation that United have been in. Ronaldo couldn't stand the fact, despite he has his faults, of course, in the situation, but he could not stand the fact that United were not competitive because he wanted to be competitive. Uh, I'm sure that Veron and Casemiro kind of coming into situations towards the end of their career didn't want to be in a situation where they're battling it out for Europa League qualification. That's not why they joined Manchester United. Um, you know, it doesn't it excuse things in a little bit, but but that is a serious problem. These these kind of influences and these things that go on, uh, you know, that it spreads. It spreads through the team. It really does. It spreads through the team. And when you have players like that, those are the ones you need the most buy-in for because they're also the players others look up to. Who do you think Alejandro Granacho is looking up to? You know, you'd think that 31 starts in a row being given to him at 19 years old by the manager, you would have undying loyalty to him. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. Not the case. He's um, got people he looks up to, you know, and, and their influence is going to affect him one way or another, rightly or wrongly. Well, I have to say in support of Ten Hag, Garnacho was dreadful against Brentford. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, I right actually now. completely agree you, with you. You. Yeah. you get this variance with any player, whether you know, yeah. very few players that are brilliant every week, right? Yeah, and you get some of that variance that's understandable. Um, but he was poor against Brentford, and he was really poor first half against Bournemouth. Now, United yeah. said he had only trained one day last week, which is fine. There's there's reason for that. But um, it's going to bring me to another issue. But, I mean, to me, Garnacho wasn't tracking his runner. Right? I agree. I mean, the driver goal was, was obvious. And if you look at the goals against Chelsea, and, you know, these are coming from wide areas, right? Uh, you need to have a problem with this in wide areas, right? Um, <clears throat> so, Tanag was right to take him off. Now, the question yeah. is, can, he has a problem here because Anthony played really well against Chelsea. And I think that even though he gave away a penalty, he was genuinely tracking back. He was tracking his runner. Um, tracking his runner. Got the sun shining on you. Yeah. Yeah, it's a late in here. <laughs> so, uh, That's a little better. There you go. <laughs> I don't need to look any more waiter than what I am. Folks um, but um, <laughs> but uh, he was tracking his runner, and I think yeah. he – would have felt like he deserved the start at the weekend, right? I completely understand that. But how do you get Anthony and Granato in the same team now? You have a big problem because neither of them are going to take well to being a backup. And someone's going to have to make a decision on who the prior, who the number one starter is there. And I think that has been Granato. And I think you would have to say that he's earned that based on the yeah. goals he scored the, and, and the contributions that he's made. Um, but, um, you know, of course, this Anthony situation where he made a claim that he was injured he, or, you know, that uh, he got injured training, he in training Friday. There's other stories being circulated out there 
um, by other people um, contradicting that. And um, I can't say 100% I know which, which side is true because obviously both sides are, are, are saying something completely different. But it would be ironic that the player that Ten Hag was accused of being of showing favoritism towards um, is now the latest one to cause turnover. Yeah, and obviously it, it's complicated. You know, I I, I tweeted out this, uh, posted this at the time as well because I've heard from at least three people independently that there was an issue around. Um, you know, his selection in terms of uh, not being selected to start and that that led to it. I was told There's this a all by a player's representative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's come from, obviously it's, yeah, it's like, look, this is, this is the nature of info. I wasn't in the room. You weren't in the room. Mm -hmm. Most of the people we speak with were not necessarily in the room. Neither was where the club is saying it was in the room either. You know, during whenever these things might have happened or, the, or these incidents may have occurred or not, um, <clears throat> there's still fairly conflicting information out there from, you know, one account who puts, you know, injury things out that said he wasn't injured. And then mm -hmm. the club said he didn't finish the training on Friday. But now this account says that he did finish training on Friday, but called out on Saturday. Now, I'd be surprised if a player was injured and unable to travel but suddenly is fit the following wednesday three or four days later because being unable to travel and be with the squad is not usually like oh i don't feel great or something like that very minor i personally you know like i said i heard it from quite a number of people and people that i trust pretty explicitly people that i know gave me information about the Jaden sancho situation prior to it blowing up as well and uh, about him leaving training early prior to uh, the public comments that were made and all of that. It's really hard for me to, uh, to, it, it's a tricky situation, you know, because I understand the club putting out the exact opposite of what is mm -hmm. being said out there. And like I said, I'm not in the room either, but um, it would be hard for me to not trust the people I was hearing it from, you know, given the track record that I have from them either. So Either way, you know, it's a, a complicated situation. Um, it's a definitely a, a complicated situation because of the reasons that you said. I think there's um, a lot of, you know, choosing a starter. I mean, look, I don't know that we we're at the stage of things where one good performance changes the starting lineup. Uh, I think it, you know, takes consistency. Anthony started most of the first half of the season and was really poor. And then Garacho got in and made an impact immediately every single game playing on the right, uh, on the right side. And, and that combination of, of Garnacho, Hoyland and Rashford was very good for, for a while. They were the only thing that worked through that winning run, you know, between January and February, they were scoring a lot of goals. Uh, and it's very hard to, and there's nothing else that's working. You know, it's not like the midfield's better. It's not like the back line is better. So it's really hard to say, yeah, let, yeah, let's let's try to change that and go back to something we were doing before. You also have Rasmus Hoyland, who's really struggling at the moment mm -hmm. to play since returning from injury. I think it was mm -hmm. another one of – I think it was probably his maybe – his last two games might have been his worst games that I've seen him play yeah. in a while. Uh, really it failed to make like an impact. Bro, those are games where United haven't been attacking. Uh, agree. I mean, it, totally agree, it, yeah. It, it, I mean, it's – their games were – any center forward in the world is going to struggle yeah. in that team yeah. because they just don't create enough. They just, it's, um, you know, it, 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 if you look at the Liverpool game, they got back into that from a mistake, Bruno Fernandes scoring yeah. in the halfway line. And then, of course, Manny coming from midfield. And, I mean, you see the wingers, see Rashford at the weekend, you know, they don't square the ball. They're not looking for a central striker. They're, they're looking for opportunities to score themselves. Yeah. And this is a, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying that that's their instinct. Yeah. You know, and so yeah. how do you need to fix this problem where you get service into a central striker with wingers that don't want to cross the ball, that don't want to put the ball across, that aren't natural wingers? You know, uh, in some weird sense, Anthony, you know, as an individual, 
you know, um, could help United in this team yeah. because they don't cut teams open from their patterns of play. They're relying on moments of individual brilliance. Yeah. But even he, you know, the, the, when you are playing a right footer on the left wing, you're asking him to cut in and shoot. You're not asking him to cut in and cross the ball because when you cut in, it's all compact. Yeah. So there's really not much you can do in that situation other than shoot. You know, it's very yeah. rare if you cut inside where teams are really compact, especially in the back four. Where's the space to find, to find a, a Santa striker? You know, I, I mean, Anthony cuts inside and shoots. Most of the time, he's not, because he's an inverted winger, you're not going to find him far out on the touchline where you would put a cross in, you know? And so this is not just Ten Hag. Lots of managers do this now where they play right footers on the left and left footers on the right. And I just think for a central striker, this is one of the reasons why we're seeing a whole dearth of central strikers now because yeah. at position, it, it's really hard to see. You know, Holland isn't a great footballer. City just created an abundance of chances, so eventually he's going to get on the end of one. But if you're in this team, any striker needs service, and I don't know where it comes from. Um, and, you know, I, I, I look at this, I think that it's the same situation, it's the same thing every single week. And yeah. Ken Hag has had to come up with solutions that he hasn't been able to do. And yeah. if you had told me back in August that this is where we'd be in April, you know, I would I would be amazed. And I know that there's been injuries, and he definitely has a lot of mitigation for why you need to run this mess that are issues that transcend him. The problem for Ten Hag for me is this. It is no longer a question of is he, does he deserve to be sacked? The only question that needs to be answered right now for any of us is we, is he the guy to take us forward? Right, yes. And and that's how, how could you say with any degree of confidence the answer to that is yes. Because you could turn around to any of us and say, look, every problem with United is not his fault. Every single one. Right, and you can admonish him of responsibility of everything. But then comes the next question. Okay, let's say that's true. Is this the guy that's going to take us forward? Because they have to get this right, and that's a whole different question. And I think for Ten Hag, with looking at him at the weekend, I felt I was looking at a guy that knew this was. I, I I'm not capable of fixing this. And I do wonder if he and his family are saying, I don't need this, you know, because I, I imagine his family are probably like, let's just go back to Holland or, you know, let's go somewhere else. <laughs> this is, you know, this is ridiculous, like the, the scrutiny. But, you know, if you, when you saw his face at the end of that game, it just looked like a guy saying, I, I'm, out of, I'm out of ideas here. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the issue, isn't it? And, and that's sort of, you know, what I've tried to make the point of for quite some time is that, if you take away all the negatives and say they're not his fault, you have valid arguments there for so mm -hmm. much of it. You really do. But all that does is bring him to, to zero. You have to be able to make a positive argument, right? You have to be able to make a positive argument where he can sit down and say, look, this is what I'm doing. These are all the positives that we're seeing that mean I could take the team forward. I could fix this. And I don't think we've seen any. For months, I cannot point to a single thing where I would say that's a positive. That is something that's really working. The one thing that I should say on that that's true is, is the integration of youth players into the team. That's one thing, which is something that's necessary, but it's not what wins you titles. It's something you have to do. You really do have to do, and is a real positive, especially at this club. Um, but overall, it would be really hard to make the argument. We've seen what we need to see over the last five, six months to say Ten Hag's the right guy going forward. And that's what the decision will be based on uh, because they didn't hire him. It's, it's you know, a massive it's, risk. James. I know it's, it's a huge it's risk. risk. I've heard a lot of opinions from people who are, who are very, you know, intelligent on this to say, look, well, we could stick with him. And then if by November it's not working, you sack him. But I cannot mm. see how you can do that. That is, that would probably be the worst possible scenario because you've wasted the entire next season. I don't think that Ineos can go into next year. If they do, I will have severe doubts. If they went into next season with Ten Hag on one year left on his contract and said, we'll see what happens. 
I think that would be a massive mistake because you, you have the potential to completely waste another year. Even if you bring someone else in and they don't turn out to be the right guy for the long term, it, you, you can still – the first season is still a season where you're allowed to make mistakes and you're allowed to figure it out uh, as Ten Hag did last year. You can't now in the third season of a manager have them no. mess up and and think, well, they might not be the right guy. You know, um, it's it would be a disaster to me. They can't afford to get wrong anyway. With yeah. PSR, they simply yes. can't afford to get this yeah. wrong. And like all business people, they make risk reward decisions. You know, and they're looking at this and they're going, the risk that this could go wrong is really high. And as you quite rightly point out, none of the people that you needed hired Ten Hag. And yeah. I don't care whether you're a Manchester United manager or whether you're a manager of a restaurant or whether you, if the people above you that hired you are no longer there and you have a whole new management team above you, you are in a very precarious position because they are not responsible for your failure. So they, it's really easy for them to sack you. David Moyes was sacked after nine months. Yep. Because he was working for people that didn't hire him. Every other manager after that were supported financially and got a lot longer. And Ten Hag is in a pretty identical position to David Moyes points wise and everything else. Mm -hmm. So it's so easy for someone to say, I'm sacking you. You're not my guy. Right. And I'm bringing in who we want. Now, there's some concerns about over who I could be, and there's a reasonable concerns. Um, yeah. But with PSR, you can't the, 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 to to 100% support Ten Hag to see this summer. You have to have the open heart surgery that Rania talked about. You have to get rid of so many players and yeah. bring so many in, right? And if some of the players that Ten Hag brought in are turning against them, right? Or that he promoted from the youth team and turned into first team players, which are essentially his players to turn against them. I find it really difficult for idiots to say this is something we should persevere with. And I I do feel for him in a lot of ways because um, United have made that job as hard as possible for anyone to succeed in. Um, but I just, I, I, I at this point, it would be more of a surprise to me if he did stay um, than he didn't. And being no doubt, James. United could very easily lose that game against Coventry because oh, every yeah. single game they lower their standard to the opposition. There hasn't been a single game this season, with maybe the exception of Palace in the League Cup, where they've dominated the game from start to finish. And I'm talking about even the 3 0 West Ham game, you know, the Everton game, they do not dominate games of football, even the Newport County game. Yeah, I agree. And, and exactly. And it's. Yeah, it is a really challenging situation. And, and you know, Eric Tenag's biggest ally was John Murtaugh. All right, so some of the other things, uh, storming yeah. of the press conference, uh, allegedly. So United say they terminated the press conference at the end. Uh, nonetheless, it doesn't look good. And they dodged the question and walked out. Um, the, obviously, United, the fact that this would be their own course to finish their worst ever season in the Premier League. He's lost 12 games, <clears throat> which is more than a third, which is unacceptable. Um, you can't do that. And I understand, like I said, I understand injuries and everything else. Um, one of the bizarre things for me about Ten Hag, that um, last season he was far more direct and critical and uh, honest, in my opinion, which was refreshing in his press conferences. And you never were doing well than what he is this season. I think that he felt that, <clears throat> you know, being that direct and criticizing players isn't getting the response that he hoped. So he's trying to keep him, you know, on side and defend him a bit. But the problem is he's also got to try to find a balance between that and sending a message to the fans that this looks nothing like what a Ten Hog team would look like. But when you're coming out and saying things like we played well, that concerns fans because that, that what that says to fans is. So you're telling me this is what a Ten Hag team looks like and what will look like and what you think playing well is. Um, I think he has uh, that. Th this is where, like, if you look at Mourinho, his last six months, he knew he was getting sacked. <clears throat> the way he communicated with the media was he started blaming everything on United. 
you know, the whole legacy football, the whole Sevilla thing they get. Not, he knew he was advertising for his next job. Um, you know, Ten Hag is still trying to keep his job and, and defend his methods. And I think that that's a mistake. Yeah, I do as well. I do as well. It's it's not, um, I don't know what purpose it serves, I guess, you know, because sometimes I sit there and wonder, who is he trying to convince? You know, is it is it us or himself about this when he says these types of things? Because anybody can look at the performances and to to regularly say that we're playing well, but being unlucky, things like that. I, I don't know how it helps. I don't know what it what purpose it serves. I really don't kind of get it. And it, it feels like somebody who's under intense amounts of pressure and knows it, but kind of doesn't want to let it on. Um, I just kind of get the impression of, of somebody who's defending themselves pretty regularly. And, and I tend to think that when a manager starts getting into what maybe what I call politician mode, which is to somewhat deflect everything, um, to talk about all the things they're doing right, and avoid, you know, criticizing the things that are going wrong uh, under their administration or however you might want to call it, then they know they're in trouble at that point in time because they're trying to sell it to, to somebody or to themselves. That's how I feel. That's how I feel about it. That's how I see it. But I totally agree. I, I find it really hard to, you know, if I'm talking to somebody that's messing something up and they will not tell me they're messing it up and they keep just telling me how they're good at something and they're good at this and they're good at this. I don't consider that they're capable of, of fixing it or changing until they've told me that they're at fault or that they, you know, essentially that they've taken responsibility for it and identified what's actually wrong in the same way. I would never trust the Glazers to fix the club because like we've talked about, I don't trust their ability to look at and say they know what was wrong and that they made the mistakes. And, um, and, and for me, I, I, I don't know, I, I, I would find it very refreshing to hear from Ten Hag, look, this is what's going wrong. This is you know what he looks like problem. to me? Yeah. He looks like a guy that is lonely, that is isolated, that feels like yeah. um, there's no support left inside the club and keep his agents yeah. above him. Um, he doesn't have anyone that he can go to. He looks like he's lampooned. And yeah. um, when you've got... There's no one you can go to to get support for, you know, players, you know, um, behaving this way. And, of course, this is what happens when clubs get bought and they go through these changes and they bring in new people. Um, the support of the people above you is so important. Jesse Marsh done a, a podcast a while ago um, where he talked about what Ralph Ranyuk, now this is something that we've talked about for a long time, told him about the dysfunction and the lack of cooperation integration between each department, which is supposed to act as an adjuvant to what you see on the pitch, they're supposed to correlate, you know, and, and understand how to use data and use information in such a way that helps, you know, give you inferences about players, about their, you know, um, you, you know their fitness and all these things that are so important that make, you know, that, that, that really are the difference at this level. <clears throat> yeah. And um, it was, uh, you know, of course, complete dysfunction, which leads me to Mark Critchley's article about Terrell Malassia. If you haven't read this, I suggest you do, because it is a long breakdown of what happened with Terrell Malassia. And you're left at the end of it in a multitude of emotions, mixture of anger, shock at the astonishing lack of care um the no control over this the, the, the failure points are the most basic that you wouldn't expect at an amateur club or you know it is truly astonishing to me the the, the lack of oversight that united have on these types of things i mean just to summarize quickly Malasia goes to holland has a you know, has a surgery on his knee, which is a relatively simple surgery. You know, cartilage. I, I've had six of them, right? And the, the recovery is relatively quick if it's done right. Um, he goes and sees a Dutch doctor, uh, which United had no oversight on, 
Um, we're not in touch with him during his rehabilitation, right? Finds out, comes back, finds out that there's still cartilage inside the knee. They, they, they can play with it and continue his rehabilitation, but there's no guarantee it'll go away. So they decide to redo the surgery with the same surgeon. This time I do have some oversight, but Malassi is admitting that United were not in touch with him during his rehabilitative process, right? Because they were didn't have enough personnel, didn't have enough staff. They were busy with people at the club. I mean, this is a professional yeah. so whole football club calls themselves the biggest football club in the world. And they haven't got enough medical staff to have oversight on rehabilitation of one of their most you know, an important first team player. This is this is insanity, right? It's so um, you know things are supposed to be improving with you know, Gary O'Driscoll coming in. Um, we done a podcast two weeks ago talking about Ten Hogs moonlighting as fitness coaches, and this yeah. this is unbelievable. This is a total scandal. But this goes on, and now Morris Malasia uh, won't be back till next season. And every single part of this was avoidable. And every single just the basic duty of care being applied, um, to the football club, to the player, and 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 doing your job is if, if that's not within your remit as a medical department, your medical department's workless. Yeah, I completely agree with you. It's you know, it, it just it's all, it, it speaks to the continuation of this because in every department at United and every area of, U, of United, you will find these exact same flaws where a lot of the basics, the simple things that should be happening every single day are just not happening. Um, and it, it, it reeks of, you know, obviously the, the kind of ranking competence that goes through the club that starts with a lack of leadership and a lack of direction and a lack of, Honestly, someone in charge. I mean, really someone in charge. And I'm sorry to say to John Murtaugh, but he was not in charge in the way that, you know, look at how he was appointed. He was not appointed to be in charge. He was appointed to be kind of a, as it was described by other people, as a bit of a fixer, right? He, that's kind of what he was known as, you know, and, and Annie Mitten gave the story on a podcast about how, you know, someone called him up about fixing sliding doors on their house. Yeah, and, we did. Oh, I'm like... Come on. And and Carl Anka was making the point. Like, what on earth is a guy like that taking those kind of phone calls for? Right. And, you know, it's like what I've said about John Murata. I've given, you know, I think he's a good person. I think he's a really hard worker. I think he's an honest guy. I don't think he was qualified for the position that he was in at all. And he was appointed, you know, internally because they didn't want to. The Glazers at Woodward, they did not want to go and get somebody who would actually want the control, the power, the influence that comes with that job in most places and the responsibility of it, um, because they didn't want to give that up. And, you know, a big part of it is empowering people to be in the positions to, to lead things. And, and it's interesting, all of that, because one of the things that I heard just this morning from somebody as well, is that, um, you know, one of the areas of, of major discontent that Ineos have is in terms of just specifically how things are organized, that United is essentially a clump. And so we've talked about this, about Ten Hag moonlighting as a fitness coach and being having to be in all of these areas. And one can blame him for it. And one can say, what, what is, how is it even set up that that is possible? If you walked into a business and you had one person who was in the middle of every single job in there, you'd think, what the hell is wrong with this place? Why is it running like this? Um, this is not how it's supposed to be. And um, that is one of the major areas of their discontent is to really segment the areas of the club from the academy, the first team, the fitness, the medical, everything, that it is really segmented and where you actually have people who are in charge and who can be held accountable. Who is accountable for Tyrone Malaysia's issue? Is there mm -hmm. anybody to be accountable for that? It started oh. last year before Gary O'Driscoll was in. So who's accountable for it? See, who's the person? Is, I don't know. <laughs> this is what happens when a business is aimless. And it has no definition of what success looks like in your occupation, in your position. Yeah. It also has no proper incentive consequence structure. Okay? When you hire somebody, especially top-end people, if you find out they're taking phone calls about how to fix, you know, sliding windows, you lose your mind because they're paying, you're paying someone too much for that. Okay, so you delegate that responsibility, and it's very clear you will not be dealing with responsibilities like this. Okay, no. 
um, you know, because there's this is a complete waste of our time. And this is exactly what happens when there is no oversight on, John, this is what your responsibilities of your job are. This is how you're going to be judged. This is going to determine. This is what we want from you. This is a very clear definition of success. And this, if you fall short, will, 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 will constitute failure. And this will, there's this consequence. People understand that, right? No matter what job you're in, right? If you're a postman, right? You have a very clear definition of what success looks like and failure looks like. Okay, you're not asked to think dogs and cats on your way around, right? Because it's not your job, right? Yeah. But when you have no one, that has oversight or has a very clear incentive and consequence structure, this is what happens. Same chaos happens with players, right? Yep. Is that if you asked pre the Glazers to define success, I guarantee you, you would not get a football answer if they're honest off the record, right? So now any of us have to do this and they have to redo all these incentive consequence structures, right? And have heads of departments that are able to evaluate their people and say, this is what will keep your job. And this is, but this yes. is what happens on the pitch, right? You can get contract renewals at United ad nauseum if, and, and not play. I mean, Phil Jones, Andy Marshall, these players should have been, I mean, there's so many players that should have been going years ago because their performance yeah. is not commensurate with how they're paid or a football club that actually values, you know, standards being upheld. So, you know, this is really not a surprise that this is happening because the there was never any intent for United to be run in such a way that allowed them to compete with the very best. They just wanted to get in the top four. And they felt that they could do that with all the chaos that's going on behind the scenes. So now it's eventually imploded. And um, personally, I never felt United were in the race for qualifying for the Champions League the minute they had no left back. So you, you can't, you, you're not going to qualify for the Champions League with no left back, I'm sorry. And nor should they expect to. Um, so it hasn't been an aspiration of mine for a while. I'll tell you what I don't like. I don't like watching games at a very little minute because even the emotional high of winning them, you know, is tampered and the emotional, you know, uh, 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 upset of losing them is brushed off in five minutes because they're basically yeah. winning anyway. Yeah. Right, so when you're in the when you're in the running for competitions for titles, you know the emotion I have running is, is high, and the devastation of losing, you know, can last for a couple of days. Now it's pushed off because you're essentially playing, not playing for anything anyway. And um, you know, I don't believe. I mean, I think if you need to beat Coventry and they end up getting City in the in the in the cup final, I mean, nine times out of ten, City are going to beat United. They need that one time out of ten. For that and, and I don't, I'm not confident, but the hope is this is the end of the previous era. Where yep. going forward, we now see progress. But James, it took Abu Dhabi 15 years to win mm -hmm. the Champions League, right? With a proper structure, financial doping up to the eyeballs, and hiring the best people in the world, sending the best players. Any of us are going to get a lot wrong as well as a lot, right? And at United, that's unforgiving. One thing that <clears throat> Ashworth and Barat and everything is going to find out is there's no hiding place for failure at United. Yeah. All, no one knew who Omar Barat was before he was hired by United. Now, all of a sudden, everybody knows. Now he's a public figure. You know, there's no operating in the shadows anymore. They start sending players that don't work out. They start sending managers that won't work out. Omar Barada's life is about to change. Don Ashworth's life is about to change, you know, if they end up getting out of the line. Yes. These people, their anonymity is over. The pressure, and I don't even think any of us know, the, know, know this yet, the pressure they're about to be put under next season, because people are not going to be patient. They're going to want demand change right away at, at immediate improvement. They need to be very, very careful about hiring someone like Gareth Southgate. Uh, and I'll tell you why. Klopp and Guardiola have big personalities, right? Mm -hmm. Ferguson was a genius <clears throat> at manipulation. You know, he had Benitez on toast. He had uh, Kevin Keegan on toast. They were mentally falling apart, right? He was brilliant at it. Southgate reminds me of Graham Potter. When Graham Potter was in big trouble at Chelsea, right? I remember when they went and played West Ham and Suchek handed the ball. He needed that win to keep his job. He's Sort of indifferent about it. Oh, I for you some get some wrong, get some right. That's got to get to me. You need a big personality at Manchester United, and you can't be a nice guy with a waistcoat. Okay. 
Uh, your club puts pressure on referees on VAR, and they end up getting decisions from us. You, you can't. I, I, I'm, Roy Hodgson was a nice guy at Liverpool, and the fans hated him. Gareth Southgate would be someone I'd be devastated if he was appointed. In it. I'd be really, really disappointed. It's not. Uh, it's not a change of excitement. I think they, any of us, have to be really, really careful about the decisions that they make. Uh, it's not not to the solutions to the problems, not just to identify the problems. Yeah, I agree. It's and it, look, it's it's a really challenging situation because if they appoint the best manager on earth and they fail, they're going to face the same criticism. You know, um, at the end of the day, they have to win. You know, uh, it, it's really all there is to it. And I don't think United will be getting Gareth Southgate. That being said, you know, I Sir Jim has very clearly asked for patience a few times right and when i look at the season for example and you look at it they got in what two months ago only officially right once post uh post the uh approval from the premier league i think it was in mid-february it's only been two months that they've been in here and one of the problems that they're dealing with when you talk about like dan ashworth wilcox the manager situation all of that and being more decisive and moving forward is is not a lack of decision making um you know psr runs on this three-year right they weren't in control of the club this year until mid-february a lot of money was spent in the back end of last summer if you look at the signings that were made with with rasmus hoyland and uh uh you know mason mount came in after july 1 i believe uh these signings are significant a significant amount of money they have to be careful because if this season results in a lot of loss for example financially then you could end up a bit handcuffed next season. Whereas I think afterwards they can, there's a, there's a big loss season that drops off and they can, they can actually pick things up uh, quite more significantly. They have to be smart about a lot of these things and, and do all of this uh, correctly and without spending an enormous amount of money to bring these people in to where it does hamstring all of the things that need to happen because there's so much that need to be happening. And if they go and spend 40, 50 million right now on uh, directors and things like that with, with abandon and they end up not being able to buy the players next year, then even if they get all the right people in place, they'll still fail. They'll still struggle. Because when I say, or if, when I give my opinion that I think Ten Hag is probably not the right guy moving forward and that we need these directors and all that, that doesn't say they don't need to replace seven out of 10 of the players at United too. They do. It's it's everything together yeah. that needs to happen. The, the question is on that: Do you two short term decisions that will mm-hmm. give you an immediate, um, you know, uh, it will give you an immediate dividend, but on the long run, you still end up in this position? So yes, I understand that you needed need to be able to bring players in the summer, but yeah. they have to do that on the basis of a foundation that doesn't exist. Totally correct. Yeah. So the most important part about this, to me, right now, is top down. Is they need yeah. to get the executives in place so that they can make the decisions that will deliver long-term success. They can't do it bottom-up because this is what's got them in the situation, in my opinion. I understand fans aren't yeah. patient. Yeah. But to me, if Dan Ashford cost $20 million and he is pivotal to completely changing your football club, I'd rather they did that. I mean, you look at the money they ended up spent on agent's fees. I know. I mean, that's far greater than something million, million, right? Yeah. Last, so you just this last eight, month. Man, 60 something million on agents' fees. Yeah. I mean, to me, that is far um, greater use of your resources, you know. And I know fans, because it's a balance, because, you know, fans will be unforgiving teams. They need to have people in place right now to make big decisions that have to get made, yep. regardless. Like they have to make a decision over Mason Greenwood. They have to make a decision over Jaden Sancho. They have to make a decision over Ten Hag. They have to make a decision over Casemiro. They have to make a decision over Varan. They have to make a decision in the left back position. You know, the, the, arguably a right back position with Wamba Saka. They, I mean, there's just so much that needs to get done. And they can't be sitting here July 1st in exactly the same position they're in sure. April 15th. They, 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 that, I mean, even even Jason Wilcox being hired, because Jason Wilcox still has to be, you know, everything he's going to, everything actionable that he's going to get is going to come from his boss. And yeah. that person has to be in place. I think Ratcliffe made a big mistake coming out and criticizing Newcastle, saying they need to be 
uh, reasonable and you know and and then i just don't see why you would have done that yeah and, and you know last week when we talked about this i mentioned that as far as i had heard um they were intending very strongly now making a point to press head on this and obviously in the last week what you've seen is um the story that came out that sir jim went and met with amanda stavely from newcastle directly face to face to talk about the dan ashworth situation uh the same article suggests that there is progress on that front and of course when you look at the timing of john murtaugh leaving it's not coincidental you know there's there's a reason for that um it to, to, from my perspective and a bit of opinion a bit of information on it is definitely uh, part and parcel to progress being made on those fronts. I think Jason Wilcox will be in around the beginning of May. Um, that is the expectation as of now. Um, they still have to totally wrap it up, but that is expected. And on Dan Ashworth, I think I think we will see progress, and I think there has been progress on it, but but you're absolutely right. I mean, for me, I, I, I've gone back and forth a little bit on it, but I am at the point where, you know, the truth is they have to do it all. They, they can't sacrifice not getting Dan Ashworth in because they need to buy players. They can't do that. Um, they have to do it right, and they have to do everything that is necessary to make this work. And, and there are so many things that, you know, even if they've decided we're going to do this, this, and this, they're not carrying it out, and they know that. You know, uh, so Jim Ratcliffe's not going to walk in there and be, I oh, yeah, let me assess the managers and, and pick the best one, and I'm going to be right because that's what Joe Glazer has done. And that's not what the successful clubs have done. And that's not what he said he would do, you know, publicly. He said exactly how it would go. Um, he's not going to be sitting and making decisions on, do we need a right-sided forward, you know, who has a, who, who's a, a scorer and a sister, or do we need another backup striker? He's not going to be making the decisions about, you know, do we promote Harry Amas over the summer or do we hire – we sign a new left back. He's not making those calls. There's no way he can make those calls and he's not going to, but those are all the decisions that have to be made, uh, that have to be made that lead to managers that lead to player signings. You can't do any of that without that. They have to make a decision about, you know, whether Lissandra Martinez is viewed as a player that they can continue to start in whatever the future plan is and, and where his health is at and whether there's so many things that go into all of this um, so many big decisions and you're right. And, and on the manager front, I think, you know, you're correct as well. I think all of them are going to have to understand the amount of pressure that they're under and that they're going to be under. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't know that everybody's going to be super happy. I, well, actually I can say this for sure. I'm positive that no matter what happens, not everyone is going to be super of course. happy because um, we're not getting pep. We're not getting Klopp. We're not getting Ancelotti. So one way or another, if it's Ten Hag staying, if it's Graham Potter coming in, if it's, you know, I don't know who the hell else off the top of my well, head. I mean, I'm just throwing uh, scenarios out there. But, but with massive risks. Yeah, because there's, no, there's nothing in his track record that convinces you that this is the right job. He's already right guy for a job. It's all potential. Yeah. And... Um, but let yeah. me let me ask ask you a question on that, just because mm -hmm. I, I want your opinion on this, on the total like honest debate of this, right? Because we talked about the point of whether you know Ten Hag's made an argument for being the right mm -hmm. person, and I think this is the sort of internal strife that we have to deal with, but also that any of us are going to have to deal with as well, because there is no obvious replacement for mm -hmm. Aaron Ten Hag, right? There is nobody you can look at and say that's the guy, hundred percent, that's the guy. We've had it before. There have been times where they thought there was an obvious replacement. You know, I think probably Jose Mourinho, if, when he came in, it should have been after Sir Alex, not years later. But there was a there was not. This is not an instant. You know, they hired Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, the, the Glazers, because they didn't know what to do after Jose Mourinho. Um, and right now, you're kind of looking at a situation where that's why it's so debated. You know, Julian Nagelsmann is very likely going to. Bayern, right? Mm -hmm. And that's probably been known for a long time. And that hasn't been a really of that valid of an option that maybe the tiniest chance of it, but we've talked about that. He's a risk, frankly, he is. Uh, I know what he's done, but he's a risk as well. Uh, anyone who's not got the experience in a, in a Premier League has some risk in them too. But I would just look at it and say, there is no clear option. There's no, no clear, there's no clear upgrade. And so a lot of it comes down to Potential versus, yeah, you know, 
risk mitigation, right? Which is not necessarily why you want to make a decision, but they'll look at Ten Hag and say, do we see a lot of potential? Yeah. there's It's hard to make an argument there, but is it riskier to bring in someone like Graham Potter, even if we think yes. he has more potential? And I'll tell you why. So yeah. here's my view. First of all, I think any of us have to be very, very careful about overrating how well their departments are going to function in the sure. beginning, right? Graham Potter went to a football club that was exceptionally well run, right? That has, you know, reasonable expectations consistent with what they are as a football club. He wasn't expected to get into Europe. You can lose five yeah. games in a row at Brighton and no one pays attention. Right, you're basically being judged on the quality of the players you're bringing through. And if you can get Brighton in the top half of the table, but bringing through young players and selling it, you're doing an unbelievable. That's a whole different ball game than what's going to have to happen at Manchester United. You will get zero credit for any of that. That's where Ten Hag is right now. Right. Yeah. So, uh, a Graham Potter, you know, lose two games, God help him. Right, because I'm gonna tell you what yeah. will happen. His Chelsea failure will be brought up. What we need to think in his personality is gonna get tore apart, his track record's gonna get tore apart, he's never won anything's gonna get tore apart. And those departments are gonna take a couple of years before their peak performance, um, to where they can properly support a coach. Right? At United, you need someone that understands the pressure of a big club, that understands the 24-7 focus that has, you know, maybe someone like Azavi, right? He's been a chaos at Barcelona. He t- he won them t- well, they won them the league. They're still in the Champions League. I mean, there's no way he'd be, getting, he'd be leaving United if he'd done that at Old Trafford. He they have a similar structure in that they have been able to promote young players, um, financially hamstrung, someone like that. Right now, Klopp and Guardiola didn't have Premier League experience. Alex Ferguson didn't yeah. have English football experience. So yes, that matters. It helps, but it's not. The most important thing, I think, big club experience can matter. Very, very careful. Yes, you have to have big club experience of dealing with pressure, it dealing with like Ibrahimovic brought this up by Ten Hag, right? When you are a, a high a high school teacher, you can get cheap students in a certain way because yes. they're so young, they haven't acquired certain skills yet, and they haven't gone to the next level, and they will respect you, but. A college professor cannot educate people in the same way a high school teacher can yeah. because people at that level have now acquired certain skills at certain, and you need to be much more precise and be able to refine people's skills that have, you, you can't be teaching high school math at, 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 at um, you know, high-end college level. And so if Ten Hagas is like a high school teacher, you're bringing through yeah. young players, they're, you know, they, they're, they're, they're yeah. trying to get to a point in their career, right? And they'll listen to you and you'll follow your instruction. But when you get to dealing with players at the very, very top, you can't do that with them because they're not going to respond to that. And they've already, you know, mastered the things that you are teaching kids at Ajax. Now, that doesn't mean that a high school math teacher can't be a college professor, but it doesn't mean that they are either. Right. So I think when you're dealing with players at United, you have to have big club experience. You have to know how to deal with those personalities and you have to have a profile that players respect. Otherwise, it's very, very difficult. And again, you're dealing with probability, not possibility. How probable is it that someone with no track record is going to come in and immediately command that respect and, and players respect? Not high. And I just think United's you know, a place where you can drown really quickly. And uh, I just, you know, th- this is where any of us have to be really careful because if they hire Graham Potter, they have to stick with him if he has a shit yep. season. Yep. Because he's your not, he, now he's your guy. Okay. Yep. Ten Hog, not your guy. What if he does worse? You know, I mean, all of a sudden those doubts are going to, Danny else know what they're doing, you know, Brailford's going to get questioned, Barada's going to, oh, like, this is a whole different world. And this is one where United don't just need a coach. They need someone that knows how to manage meet the media, the pressure, the stress, the, the players that, you know, and of course you have a situation which just quickly to talk about this, which is indefensible. United have relationships with outlets Right, which their players are given information to 
you know, that quite frankly, United should be mortally embarrassed about. Um, I'm not asking every outlet that works with United to have journalistic standards and to have an editorial policy that's based on making sure verification and truth. Some people are just out for entertainment and they don't give a shit what's true, what's not true. You know, they don't care about any of that. <clears throat> if your employer worked with an organization where you, they didn't criticize, they abused, okay, said things like, you're fucking shit fucking manager, fuck this fucking guy. I mean, what? This is, this is the bottom of the barrel, lowest common denominator, and you're going to turn around and send this manager's players to this, to this organization? I mean, there's a space for everybody. I'm not being snobby. They can do what they want. But United put my access over criticizing the Glazers too virulently. So apparently that must mean two things. One, that this outlet, the United stand, doesn't criticize the Glazers anymore, right? Now, this is the same guy when I had Luke Shaw. My podcast said that the reason why they weren't getting that access is because they were critical of Glazers. So I assume they meant that their editorial policy to be such to be to be less critical of the Glazers in such a way that um, gets them access. And it also means that you can say what you want about players. You can be uh, you, you they can get bond threats, but you can't criticize the Glazers. That's the one thing that will have your access removed. What does that say to the players? Right? What does that say to Ten Hag? I mean, this is a scan. This is embarrassing. No other Premier League football club does this. Right? I mean, have some respect for your own employees. And you can't legitimize these people as a news source when they're not trying to be a news source. They're just trying to be entertainers. Right? And that's okay. People can do that. And I'm, I'm you know, criticism and abuse, people can just decide for themselves where the line is. Right? Um, and I may have crossed it many of times myself. I'm not saying that. Uh, and if you need to want to reprimand me for that, the way within the race to do so, right? But I've had phone calls from United and so have you about being responsible with certain coverage just for a word, right? Yeah. You know, over 10 hog speculation about his job, they were not happy about that. Well, how is it that they have a calibrated editorial policy of standards that's held other people to this height and these people to this level? And these are the people that get access. I mean, you know, if OJ Simpson, you know, had a podcast with 5 million followers, would you just give him United players before he died? You know, well, hey, you know, it's all the means justifies the ends, right? As long as you got the, the, the follower count, then we see utility. What does that say to young journalists and podcasts? Don't worry about ethics. Don't worry about morals. Don't worry about doing it right. Just get a fucking follower count and we work with you. Man, I'm sorry. Like, that is a major problem internally where... It's an illustration of the complete erosion of standards and basic respect for the club and, and demanding that anybody who wants to work with this football club, they have a, these people have an opportunity to be responsible with their coverage, but they're not interested in that. They don't even get them followers, likes, downloads, and they know outrage drives engagement. Why you need to reward that, I have no idea. Yeah, I hear you. And it's, it's, a, it's a constant kind of struggle i mean i know that in this podcast we do every single week there's things that you and i talk about beforehand after and otherwise. what do we not talk about and what so much of it doesn't get on here just because we of, of, of attempting to be responsible with the things that we say and to not create more challenge more difficulty more pressure for the people you know at united for the people at all levels of united from mm -hmm. from staff to coaches to players to all of it and my personal opinion is that you know it, it 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 it's better to be responsible for those things you know um that's just where the to me the priority lies to be responsible with those things to not to not create the, the trouble you know to not not create trouble for people to not create trouble for situations you're not responsible for the actions that other people take or any of that sure. but to them Scandal is yeah. to them. There's no, there's no threshold that they'll say. You know what? This might hurt a human being. It's probably yeah, responsible yeah. put this in the public domain. I'm not going to say anything. I have stuff on my phone right now from players and players' representatives that I would never put in the public domain. That would get me millions of downloads if I did. I'm a yeah. I'm not an example of who you are, but I'm just saying like yeah. this is. I don't understand this. Yeah. You know, and, and it's it's something they have to choose, you know, United, which way that they want to go um, with things and what they want to do and, and what they want the, 
you know, what they think the outcome will be. You know, I, I, I think that there is room for everybody to, to be involved, mm -hmm. but I think that United should be the ones to say what is acceptable and what's not to work with us. Mm -hmm. They should be able to do that and they should have those standards. And then if, if, if they say, if they say that, then people can conform to it or not. Mm -hmm. And that would be fine. You know, but if they're not going to say that, then it's never going to change. It's never yeah. going to change. And I think it is on the club more than it is, frankly, on the outlets to to change that. It is. It's like like you said, they could be anyone could be entertainment and have their mm -hmm. own space and their own thing that they create and do. And this is how we want to do things. And if the club tell them that's fine, then why would it be different? Why would they change what they're doing? Let me just add one other thing to this, James, because this is important. When Mark Goldbridge was getting abused, and he was on social yeah. media, I had him on my podcast because I don't agree with that. Yeah. Right? And I don't believe in abusing him when I'm complaining about the abuse that they can be critical. They could say, I don't believe this is correct. I also don't believe anyone should be the target of sustained abuse because I think that is devastating for a human being mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. when you have a million followers you could choose to be responsible with your messaging and get earn people's respect or you can reach or you know fast food coverage of garbage nonsense um verbal diarrhea and just con you know some of the stuff that they're saying is um i look at that and they go how you need not embarrassed i mean how on earth is any of that you know, any got any journalistic merit. If you have no journalistic merit, that's fine. You don't have to be journalist, that's fine. Uh, if you're entertainers, that's fine. Okay, but quite frankly, and I know this for a fact, there are players in said United that hate them, right? And they're livid that there's a relationship there. And I've and they've told me that themselves. So United know this, of course. But still choose because there's reasons that you and I are not going to get into right here why they worked with them at all, and it had nothing to do with Merv. But it, like it, it, it's not people can say what they want, you know that they disagree with this. That's up to them. Um, and I understand the United have to work with people like the Daily Mail, right? People that have organizations that are some of the worst of the worst right so it's up to them to decide what those standards are right but to me there should be consequence and there shouldn't be uh, a acquiescence between outfits that deliberately target players with not professional constructive criticism but personal criticism that you know, quite frankly, is isn't criticism. It's it's an insult. It's insulting. It's 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 a personal attack. And uh, I don't know. Imagine that your your employer was doing that. What would that say to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just tells you it's okay, and that's that's the concern. That's wow. The well, you mean you hit your employer, right? Yeah. And I know the fact that there's certain players that feel that way. Yeah. And I'm not going to name them. Yeah. Because partly because of this, because they feel that they're completely let down. Yeah. And that anyway, or should know this story. All right, meeting. We don't know our 10 minutes. Talk to your people. Um, uh, today is tax day in the US, so I've got to yes. pay my taxes. So, good um, luck. Oh my god, it's so much fun. You just, just don't know what that message so, it's the best um, thing ever, isn't it? Well, it's amazing. So, uh, okay, I'm going to split here. I'll catch you later. Uh, thanks to all of you for all your downloads, likes, sweet tweets, follows, everything. Much appreciated. Yeah, and, thank you um, all. Appreciate it. We'll be back again next week. See you, man. Cheers.